Hi, everybody. Welcome to New York City. This is theCUBE's coverage of the AWS Financial Services Symposium. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Scott Hebner, who is uh, co-hosting today. Yeah, we just came off the keynote, uh, Scott Mullen's keynote. He described that they first had the uh, symposium in 2015 at the Roosevelt Hotel, which I think is closed, a small pop-up. And I think they had 35 people there. There, were, there must have been at least six, 700 people, maybe five or 600 people in the keynote and a bunch of people milling around in the audience. And so we're super excited. I mean, it's all about how financial services is adopting uh, not only the cloud and the cloud services and the fundamental cloud services, but also um, numerous other agentic uh, agent building platforms, leveraging bedrock. So uh, a lot of discussion around that innovation. We're pleased to have Chris Parrish here as the senior data scientist at SAS Institute coming off a big show down in Orlando. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks so Good much for coming on the program. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for being there. So being there. we know SAS. I mean, I was commenting, that's what we used in college. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we were all trained on it and, you know, still to this day, you know, have fond memories. Yeah. Uh, and so, and you guys are, have evolved, you know, dramatically. I've been to some of your events and you, you heavily invested in technology and AI. Where do you fit in this whole AI spectrum. Yeah, so I mean, we're we're definitely evolving, and, and the platform is is moving with the customers to the cloud, and so that's the 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 this this, this asset that you probably have been familiar with is one primarily of a language that's built on top of you know functions and algorithms, um, and that underpins you know all of our products today. And so what we're what we've been working on for the past ten years and perhaps even longer is to be able to uh, take the technology to the cloud with our customers moving next to their data. And so the 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 types of uh, uh, act, applications that we're building today are, are 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 still using that foundational SaaS as the technology base. Um, we're just making that more accessible through different uh, uh, interfaces as well as <clears throat> uh, connections with with different data sources, uh, as well as being able to, you know, enhance our current current uh, product suite to to make those purpose built solutions for uh, both you know, financial services customers and and other customers in our portfolio. So simplifying the experience, but also. Yeah. Supercharging it, yeah, it's supercharging and bringing in more users, right? I mean, that that's that's really the goal. If if you know the 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 SaaS language itself is really just a very small component of the bigger platform. I mean, there we do have a very large install base uh, of of SaaS users, but uh, clearly, you know, there's there are new technologies out, and we're 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 um, we ha we have to we have to connect with them, and and so that's what we're doing to be able to uh, have uh, users really using any other tool to plug into our our ecosystem to to eventually get to the business decisions that they want to get it. And that's what, we, that's what we've been doing best for, for all these years. Yeah. So when LLMs first hit the scene, um, it, it, it was you know, pretty obvious that uh, people were excited, but then they try to apply them. Yes. Uh, and then they say, well, well, wait a minute, and especially in financial services. And I know, Scott, you were just down at the, the, the conference. Yeah. And I'm sure you heard a lot about this. So I want to get into, maybe you could summarize the conference a little bit, what you, what you learned. And then I, I want to understand from SAS, like, you know, why do LLMs fall short and, and and what are you guys doing to sort of build that robustness and that compliance and that, you know, non-hallucinative capability? Yeah. But Scott, why don't you kick it off with your quick summary? Yeah, I thought you guys did a really nice job at the conference. Yeah. I mean, I think you took your customers on a tour yep. from 50 years of history as a powerhouse in data analytics. Then you got into the conversation about LLMs and then into Gentic AI and agents, right. digital twins and yep. what if simulations, right up through quantum AI. Mm -hmm. And you pulled that all together, but you framed it. And I remember the, the graphic, it was a rainbow with the unicorns yeah, you know, right. about LLMs, <laughs> right? Great. And making the point that they're in a, insufficient alone because your overriding theme was decision intelligence. Right. So. You know, yeah, that is right, it. and uh, you know, it is. It is the technology evolves, and 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 it is a software company. We have to evolve with it, and so we do recognize that um, there there is there is a there are different hype cycles as, as technology evolves, and there's 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 life cycles to that as well. And so I think that the unicorn uh, type of graphic was really there to to say like you know there isn't any easy buttons in this, and 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 there's not something that is going to magically change your business. It's really going to have to be an integration with. A variety of different services or different types of uh, controls that you're putting in place, and so that that's what that's that's the picture we're painting is you know these are great tools um, they're 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 incredibly innovative mm -hmm. um, they will continue to get better uh, but but we see them as 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 a as a piece of a bigger puzzle and that's where sort of the you know agentic AI kind of, right. kind of comes into play in in that you're you're 
the way I think about it, the way we think about it, Jane, again, my, me, my, my, myself personally, is it's really just an application of AI. I mean, you're automating processes and you're trying to find those use cases that are uh, initially low risk, high return, and, and, and how can you extract costs out of those processes? And to do that, you know, sending something to an LM is, and getting something back is probably not going to do that for you. You're going to have to orchestrate that with rules, with, with maybe um, traditional models, with data queries, with workflows, um, all cum culminating into one sort of super decision that gets you that answer that's governed, that has the appropriate level of automation with human in a loop, and that has that orchestration tool that, that, that helps you put all that together. Scott um, Mullins in his keynote, he referenced uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who's an author and a futurist. Uh, it, I've heard this recently in this whole AI wave. He's got three laws. His third law is, quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And when hmm. you think about agents, it sounds like magic, although you just mentioned a number of things that aren't magic. It's just, it's sort of core technology is, right. that, that enables you to create what seems like magic. I wonder yeah. if you could, you know, double click on that. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, it, the, what's likely going to happen, I'm not, you know, prognosticating, but I think what's going to happen is that as companies sort of assess those, those use cases, they're going to want to have some type of expectation of what those use cases are going to return for them. And so to be able to do that, you have to uh, show that you're uh, putting some governance around that and putting uh, some uh, some guardrails and some fail safe. So I mean, if you look at like the 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 you know you know in in the in the world we live in today, there's there's full automation or, or near full automation, maybe like in in driving and and other features. But there's still some fail safes in there. There's ways to sort of uh, stop the system if, if it needs to stop. And that that's where those I would say more bespoke type of processes will come into play. And you can even see this evolving into agents, uh, you know calling agents, calling agents, calling agents, calling. And that's where, you know, our software is built to uh, embed not just a, you know, one and done decision, but multiple agents within sort of a, a super decision. And so as they evolve and become more, um, I, I think as customers become more, users become more comfortable with that concept and they have the right governance, then they're going to begin to say, well, I have this agent that does this and this agent that does this. And, and, and how do they all talk to each other? Yeah, so it's you, an orchestration of it. You guys really hit the trust factor really nicely last, yeah. last week. And, you know, without trust, it's the currency of innovation, right? No trust, no ROI, especially if you're making decisions. And I thought you did two things really well around that. One is the, like the introduction of Epic Games into the yep. digital twin simulations, because you can visualize it, you can see it. Right. That's going to enhance people's trust. I also felt you told a good story about the verticalization of the models and the agents you guys are going to build. You know, right. Very domain specific, because if you're going to try to help emulate how humans think and make decisions, you have to understand those domains. Right. So you you know covering all that you know around the core via platform yeah. came across really well. I thought. Yeah. So I mean, and that that's been you know the 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 core, you know we're we're, we're the, the agentic piece of it. You know, we've been doing sort of agentic uh, analysis or agentic decisioning for for many many years, um, and that's built into our core technology. Mm -hmm. So if you when you buy our platform, you can get that sort of embedded with it. So it's not it's not a futuristic kind of uh, uh, technology. We have it today. Um, what's different is what can I pull into that decision? You know, what kind of new technology? What kind of uh, how can I leverage LLMs or some other generative AI um, technology to 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 enhance that process so that I'm I'm automating it even further. So Agentic is really going to be an automation tool, but it's going to be an automation leveraging even more uh, sophisticated technology so that you can extract even greater costs. So what does Gen AI bring to that equation? Uh, is it, um, are you able to interact with the system through natural language? Is it also taking probabilistic um, AI and somehow applying it to, to maybe uh, tighten up some of the false positive. How does uh, 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 how does uh, uh, Gen AI fit into that? Because yeah. you're saying you've been doing agentic, you know, workflows for right. a while. So yeah. with you know, machine, sorry, traditional machine learning. Right, right. Or mean, statistics, or yeah. even just rules. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So okay. So what does what does Gen AI bring? Well, it brings it to it. So so it has you know. Where, where you need to do maybe some type of, of large summarization. So, mm -hmm. it, so say you get, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of data coming out, unstructured data that the companies have, that uh, it, it it's it's almost impossible to kind of go in and get some type of summary from it without using some type of large language. So, so that brings so that the large language 
the large language will bring that sort of technology into the process. So you can begin to look at um, what types of, of prompts I want to then uh, assess or, 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 or um, uh, put into that LM. And so that means that you can now begin to manage those prompts or you can begin to manage, maybe you want to select a number of large language models. Maybe you want to compare them. Maybe you want to do like A-B testing on them, which one gives me the better result. Uh, but that, but that bring, but what it brings in is the ability to take a lot of that unstructured data and pull it into those, I would say, traditional type of, uh, you know, agentic decisioning roles, which is, you know, primarily been, you know, rules-based or, uh, you know, advancing to statistical and machine learning models. There, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago on how the LLMs are getting more and more so-called reasoning, chain of thought, things mm -hmm. of that nature. And actually the hallucination rates are going up. Yeah. And I think it's because I think it was the rainbow going back to that uh, unicorn statement that, you know, generative AIs and LLMs are not really designed to help you make decisions. Right. Right. They're correlation based. And, and again, I think what, what you guys are doing is you're building upon that as a core foundation and engine and adding the decision intelligence on top of it with the trust factor and the governance and the guardrails. And, you know, with your history as, uh, you know, around analytics, yeah, you know, in the partnerships you have with AWS and others. Yeah. 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 So, so the, the, the idea is like, you know, you, 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 as you do this, you look at these use cases and say, you know, do I even, the first question is, is do I even want to use this type of technology in my process? Right. And so that's, that's the sort of first gating question. Then the other question is, is what kind of automation do I want in the process and, 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 and how do I govern that? And governance being like, what? what are your tolerance? What's your pain thresholds? Where are your fail safes in that? So that you're not, you know, uh, if it's, you know, and a lot of things that we're seeing now today with our customers, talking to, talking to customers sort of across the world, um, is that they have lots of ideas and they have lots of interest, but there's not really a, a, a way to sort of tactically put all that together. So we want to come in and say, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're looking at this technology, it's fantastic technology, how do you tactically put that in place so that you are um, getting the kind of results that you want? You know, what is good, what's the good enough result? Is 60% good enough? Probably not. Is 80% good enough? I don't know. So those are things that the companies have to sort of determine internally to say, you know, what is my pain threshold, so to speak, for, um, you know, the, that's this particular project that I'm using, Agentic AI, and, and, and how can I um, convince the people I need to convince that it's, that it's sufficient to be able to do that, um, so we're working with customers all over the you know all, the, all over the world really to to try to um, understand what the what the use cases are, and so I would say we're in the early stages, um, and that's that's uh, that's to be expected. So, so that involves what you described some trial and error. Yeah. Right? Hey, check it out. Well, sixty percent is not good enough. We know that. Okay, let's try to seventy five percent. What kind of feedback are you getting from your users? You start to scale it a little bit, and you, maybe we need to tighten that up a little bit. So. The cloud makes that easy experimentation. Right. What is your relationship with, with AWS? And I want to come back to sort of you're, you're suggesting that we're early days, but I, I want to dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So um, broadly speaking, you know, our relationship with AWS is, this, you know, we have a strong partnership. We have, uh, you know, transitioned a lot of our clients to, so traditional SaaS, for those not familiar, is is, is typically installed in, you know, data centers and servers and and, and it's run in, in, uh, uh, through, you know, their administrators. And obviously some of that, some of that, that, that's changing. And so we're working with a lot of our customers, um, uh, some of our banking customers like uh, Yuska Bank in Denmark, and we have some insurance customers, uh, uh, SBI uh, in, um, in India, and we have Toyota Financial Services in Italy that, are, that have all sort of moved to AWS and, you know, are, are leveraging our platform on AWS. And so that's really our, our goal is to, is to, is to, is to, for those customers that are ready and are wanting to move the cloud and then AWS, AWS is their partner, we're, we're, we're helping them make those, make those migrations. We also have a, a variety of, uh, and what makes us different probably than a lot of other software develop software companies is that we have all these purpose-built solutions as well. So we have risk management solutions. We have marketing solutions, we have fraud solutions, and those are purpose-built for those particular domains. And those are all can run on AWS as well. So you mentioned it's early days, but we, we, we're now a few years in yeah. to this AI you know, awakening. Um, let's, let's say it's a nine inning game, are we a third of the way through? It's clearly not the first, in, top of the first anymore, right? I mean, we've gone through a lot of POCs, been a lot of experimentation. Sometimes we, you know, the, the narrative is, hey, the people are stuck in POC purgatory. You talk to, you listen to the AWS keynotes. It's like, there's real use cases actually going yeah. on. Talk to some of the people here. So, you, you know, the truth is kind of somewhere in the middle. What, how do you see it? Yeah, so I think there, there, there is, I, I, the, the large, I would say like, 
you know, and, and this is anecdotal, right? So, so, yeah. so we're, we're just talking to people, but I would say that most of this, and, I, and this is probably focusing on, you know, the size of the organization as well, but I would say the larger financial service organizations are, are have budget and they want to be able to access this technology. And so what they're trying to do is find those internal use cases that are going to help them uh, identify cost savings primarily. And so there are probably going to be those uh, situations where you can extract some type of, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of proxy FTE reduction, right, of some sort. And so those probably aren't going to be use cases where you're making uh, uh, decisions that are going to impact the customer directly. Or if you do, then there's obviously some more human sort of in the loop in, that, in those situations. So what we're seeing with our larger customers is that they're building out some, uh, some, some systems to be able to extract cost savings from certain processes, whether it be collections or uh, customer support, those things internally that, you know, I think are probably less regulated and they can, they can have a little bit more leeway and kind of, kind of feel their way through the system and, 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 and determine what, um, what type of sort of risk appetite they have for adopting these types of systems. And I'd say on, on the, you know, for some of our smaller customers, it's, it's really just trying to automate some of their, some of their, um, their daily tasks, you know, um, and we're so, building that, we're building some of that into our, in our platform as well. So like within, uh, you know, within the platform, we have, we're building a co-pilot. So you can say, you know, build, build me a dashboard that can, shows, shows me, you know, the sales trajectory, you know, and it builds out the yeah. dashboard. So thinking about SaaS generally and, and the financial services opportunity specifically, where do you want to be a year from now? What do you want to be able to say a year from now that you can't say today? Well, we'd like to be able to have a lot of our customers, you know, take advantage of the scaling in the cloud with our software. Um, I think that, you know, we're, we we've we've done a we've done a great job in our R and D side, and we have incredible technology. You guys have talked to the to the folks that are in the team, um, and we have incredible uh, applications and and ability to take their their work to the next level. And so we're working with customers closely, you know, through our partners, to, like AWS and some of our other consulting partners to, to get that message out to our customers to say that this isn't just about a SaaS language. This is about accelerating what you're doing and making business, trusted business decisions. And so that's our path forward is to be able to send that message and to have our customers, uh, migrate to a, a platform that's modern and that fits their needs. We're seeing a breakthrough in financial services. Things are getting faster, uh, but at the same time, they can't break, right. know, especially in this industry. Chris, thanks so much. For thank you very much. I appreciate it. it. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you for watching. Keep it right there. This is theCUBE at AWS Financial Services Symposium from New York City. We'll be right back after this short break.